silence the Right Honourable the Lord Mayor. President, Provost, Dr. Bryson, Sheriffs, ladies and gentlemen. It is my very great pleasure to welcome you all to Guild Hall this evening and to extend the city's very warm greetings to everyone here as we mark the 350th anniversary of the Royal Society. The city is rightly proud of its links with the Royal Society and the, and the support it provides to science in so many ways. After all, the Royal Society's origins are entwined with its links to Gresham College, itself still going strong, a strong partnership with the city and still making a major contribution to cultural, scientific and commercial thought. And the city and the Royal Society are both proud of the work and enduring legacy of two of our greatest sons, Christopher Wren and Robert Hooke. Anyone who comes through the city or has any feeling for it will be struck by Wren's enduring impact through the architecture, life and work of the city's churches, let alone his greatest achievement at the cathedral. Hook himself was an officer of the city corporation, the city's surveyor, performing, it is thought, over half the surveys of the burnt-out city after the Great Fire, as well as serving as Gresham Professor of Geometry. Wren and Hook did much for London, and much for science. And the city is proud that we have recently restored their most prominent joint surviving project, the monument, itself a combination of memorial to an historical event and scientific laboratory. And the city is just as proud of the support it now provides to the, nation, uh, the nation's science space. The markets have a range of financial products supporting the needs of investors in research and development especially in the new crucial markets for green energy. Indeed, the financial services industry and our scientific are closely connected. Many of the innovations in the financial services industry, such as the introduction of sophisticated financial instruments, have been the brainchild of mathematicians, physicists and engineers. And the city's livery companies, who often quiet, often unsung, but nonetheless significant charitable work, play a major role, and many do a great deal to support our scientific and manufacturing base. On which note, you will have found a leaflet on your chairs this evening. Nearly a third of the city livery companies, 28, 28 out of the 108, are involved in promoting science. And to celebrate the Society's 350th anniversary, they have come together to produce this summary of the very important work and support that they give to science. Clearly, as Lord Mayor, my role is to promote our world-class financial services industry. But I know as well that the UK remains a world leader in developing new cutting-edge, high-value-added discoveries, inventions and applications, all essential precursors of advanced knowledge-based industries. And the livery has and will continue to do much to th to, through its support for science in education and research. So I invite you to engage with them to support the next 350 years of British scientific success. And anybody that has reached its 350th birthday deserves our heartiest congratulations. And the anniversary year has been a year of great achievements. The Royal Society's current programme of work is an inspiring one. It has raised over £100 million to support its work in grant making, science policy and education. It has organised a fantastic range of events and activities to mark its anniversary, especially its local heroes and capital science campaigns, engaging the support and enthusiasm of 150 institutions across the country. It has been an excellent year to mark a wonderful history and a wonderful future as well. So my very heartiest congratulations to everyone who has contributed in whatever way and especially to the Fellows of the Royal Society, a good number of which are here tonight. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Sheriff, Chief Commoner, my Lords, ladies and gentlemen, 
As you have seen, the Lord Mayor has unavoidably to leave us, but may I begin by thanking him, both for himself and as President of Gresham College and, of course, as Lord Mayor, for the contribution that he has made, what he has said this evening, and uh, thank him also on behalf of the Corporation for their hospitality today. They and the Lord Mayor and the officers of the Corporation have shown great interest in this occasion, have regarded it as, as, uh, as it is an extremely important piece of the city year. And we at Gresham, and I'm sure the Royal Society, are equally grateful. I'm Roderick Flood, the Provost of Gresham College, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. As the Lord Mayor has said, we're meeting uh, particularly to celebrate the birthday of the Royal Society. But in fact, we're meeting to celebrate, I think, the association between four venerable British institutions, of whom the Royal Society is actually the youngest. It began within Gresham College, which itself was founded in 1597, and Gresham itself is an institution of the city which, of course, is several centuries older than that. And the fourth institution, I'm sure some of you can think who it is, is Wadham College, Oxford, which celebrates its 400th anniversary today and has a claim to be the equal founder with uh, Gresham of the Royal Society. We'll be marking that association uh, by a conference in Oxford in a few weeks' time. Over hundreds of years, all these institutions have changed greatly, but I think they've remained true to their original missions. The corporation, as the Lord Mayor has said, is now the guardian of the greatest financial centre in the world. The Royal Society is the greatest scientific institution. Gresham College continues to give as Sir Thomas Gresham intended, free public lectures in the city. But those lectures are now seen or heard through the internet by a million people each year around the world. Only Wadham College Garden remains much as it was when Warden Wilkins planned to launch from there his trip to meet the man in the moon, an ambition which the Royal Society has so far not achieved. <laughs> Many of these associations between these institutions have been marked by the splendid volume which our speaker today, Bill Bryson, edited earlier this year. I'm tempted to describe him also as a British institution, but certainly not a venerable one. He is, of course, an example by birth, by marriage, and by migration of the close connections between this country and the United States. And his books have illuminated and enlivened our two countries and much else and many parts of those two countries. We're delighted that he is to speak to us today. And I have much pleasure on behalf of Gresham College and the Royal Society for, in inviting him to speak on an even shorter history of nearly everything. Mr. Bryson. Sheriffs, uh, Lords, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Roderick, for those kind words of introduction. I am thrilled and astounded to find myself standing here before you tonight. This is a very great honor for me, uh, so thank you for making this possible for me. You know, right now, as we're standing here, uh, all, all across my hometown, Des Moines, Iowa, people are stopping whatever they're doing, and they're, they're saying, What's that noise? And the noise, I can tell you, is the sound of Mrs. Smoltz, my high school careers officer, spinning in her grave. <laughs> At the thought that Bill Bryson is now standing in the Guildhall in London, about to give a speech on behalf of Gresham College and the Royal Society. So thank you very much for, for allowing me to have this very proud evening tonight. Now, I, I must begin with a couple of, of small apologies. Um, apart from the obvious ones, that I, I'm not a lecturer, uh, that science is not my field. 
uh, and that I have a pathological inability to gauge how long any speech I write will actually take to deliver. Uh, this could take 11 minutes or it could take an hour and a quarter. There's simply no telling. Uh, th I have one very big apology to start with and, and that's that essentially um, I have given the wrong title for my speech. The, I ha I've had a, a really crazy year. If, if, if you could forgive me for that. It was going to be a pretty crazy year anyway, but then in June I had a book of my own come out, uh, and that always multiplies to hysterical proportions the, d the number of requests I receive to speak and, and do interviews and attend literary festivals and take part in, in other distracting events. So uh, it has been really quite a, a, a distracted year, and, and when Barbara Anderson, the kindly uh, academic registrar of Gresham College, asked me earlier in the year uh, what my topic for tonight would be, in a, in a moment of total preoccupation, I, I said to her, an even shorter history of nearly everything. And only much later, in, in fact only in the last couple of weeks, when I turned to this, this uh, uh, obligation in, in earnest, did it, did it dawn on me that actually I'm supposed to be talking about the long history and glorious achievements of the Royal Society. So what I propose to do this evening, uh, with your permission, is I would like, first of all, to talk about the Royal Society and what it has done and why it is important to every one of us. Uh, it is an issue that could hardly be more timely as we all gird ourselves for the spending cuts that are about to descend upon us. Then, in case there is anyone here who's traveled down from Shetland to hear a lecture on, on a short history of nearly everything, I will give a really, really short history of nearly everything. <laughs> Uh, the two topics do actually fit together after a fashion, I think. Uh, at least I hope so. So first, let me start with the Royal Society. According to my most careful calculations, the Royal Society was founded 350 years and 51 days ago, or actually 350 years, 51 days, and perhaps two or three hours ago, uh, on a late November afternoon at a location about 600 yards from where we are right now. The site today is occupied by the enormous building that was long called the NatWest Tower and is now, I understand, called Tower 42, though in my view it doesn't get any more attractive however many times you change the name. <laughs> but at that time it was the headquarters of Gresham College. Now we know that on that late wintry afternoon an audience of unknown size gathered to hear a young and not yet famous Christopher Wren give a lecture on astronomy and that afterwards, 12 of those people, Wren among them, retired to the rooms of one Lawrence Rook, and there agreed to form a society. And for the first two years, that is all they called it, the society, to promote the accumulation and propagation of useful knowledge. Now, rather ambitiously, they set the enrollment fee at 10 shillings a head, and the fee for attendance at the weekly meetings at one shilling. That's equivalent, in modern terms, to 500 pounds to join and 50 pounds to hear the lectures. A lot of money, in other words. These guys were very serious about what they were doing. Nobody had ever done anything quite like this before or would ever do it half so well as again. It was truly a milestone event in human affairs. What they were doing really was founding modern science, and they seemed to know it. The Royal Society, it became royal with the granting of a charter in 1662 by Charles II, a man who, incidentally, didn't ever pay a fee or attend a single meeting, essentially established all the conventions of modern science. It invented the scientific journal and the process of peer review. It systematized experimentation. It made English the primary language of scientific discourse in place of Latin, though with one or two notable exceptions, not least Newton's Principia, which was published in Latin. But even Newton then wrote uh, most of his other papers are, are on optics, for instance, in English. And it's fair to say that the primacy of English as the language of science dates from the founding of the Royal Society. In addition, the society promoted and indeed insisted upon clarity of expression in place of high-flown rhetoric, and even more unusually, encouraged the coinage of new terms used precisely. Among the words introduced to the world by the Royal Society in its early days, it seems, were cohesion, tension, elasticity, temperature, and pharmacology. From the outset, the fellows of the Royal Society showed a tireless and, and indeed at times breathtaking curiosity about almost everything. Nothing, it seems, was beneath their attention. 
members discussed and considered woodland management, blood transfusion, architectural load barrier, the behavior of gases, the development of the pocket watch, the thermal expansion of glass, and much, much else. Before most people had ever even seen or tasted a potato, the Royal Society debated the practicality of making it a staple crop in Ireland, ironically as a hedge against famine there. <laughs> Two years after the Society's formation, Christopher Merritt, a founder member whose expertise was actually in birds, demonstrated a method for fermenting wine twice over, endowing it with a pleasing effervescence. He had invented champagne. The next year, John Aubrey contributed a paper on the ancient stone monuments at Avebury in Wiltshire and so effectively created archaeology. John Locke contributed a paper on the poisonous fish of the Bahamas. Edmund Halley, the great astronomer, happened upon figures for annual births and deaths in Breslau in Silesia, which fascinated him because they were so unusually complete. Now, most people would have treated these figures as an interesting diversion, but Halley realized that from them, he could construct charts from which it was possible to work out the life expectancy of any person at any point in his existence. He could say that for someone aged 25, the chances of dying in the next year were 80 to 1 against, that someone who had reached the age of 30 could reasonably expect to live another 27 years, and that the chances of a man of 40 living another seven years were five and a half, five and a half to 1 in his favor, and so on. He had, in short, produced the world's first actuarial tables, and so made the life insurance industry possible. Again and again, the Royal Society demonstrated that it was an institution dedicated not just to understanding the world, but to changing it and improving it in any way it could, often in the most unexpected ways. Now, the names I've mentioned already just in the last minute or so are pretty telling. John Locke, John Aubrey, Edmund Halley, Isaac Newton, Christopher Wren, and so on. Patently, from the very beginning, the Royal Society attracted the best minds. This combination of great minds and boundless curiosity is obviously a good formula for forming a learned society, but that alone has actually not been enough to sustain 350 years of continuous distinction at the very highest level. For that, the Royal Society needed to do certain other things, things that no other society had ever done before. Three in particular, I think, stand out. Excuse me. First, from its earliest days, the Royal Society was truly international. As they like to remind you at the Royal Society, it had a foreign secretary a hundred years before the British government did. Just three years after its founding, it accepted its first foreign members, and soon it was welcoming papers from contributors like Marcello Malpighi in Italy and the great, eccentric, and wonderfully prolific microsco microscopist Atten van Leeuwenhoek in the Netherlands. The result that it, was became, it became a, the central clearinghouse for scientific information in the world, a kind of early version of the World Wide Web. Second, the society has always elected people for their abilities rather than for their background or bearing. It was the first really important institution in the world to be driven primarily by merit rather than considerations of breeding. Third, and in many ways the most extraordinary of all, the Royal Society has always had the most incredible knack for selecting people before they gave any particular hint of the greatness that would earn them their posterity. Edmund Halley was made a fellow before he'd even finished at Oxford. Charles Darwin, elected in 1839, just three years after his youthful Beagle voyage, was not even known for his work on barnacles, much less on evolution, when he became a fellow. William Henry Fox Talbot was elevated to fellowship long before he had the first vague inkling of giving the world photography. It is extraordinary, truly, how many fellows of the Royal Society achieved their greatest distinction after joining. In consequence, the Society didn't become a club of grand old men whose greatest achievements were behind them, but rather a place whose members were firmly and excitingly at the leading edge of scientific development. It is these additional aspects, I would submit, that have truly made the Royal Society incomparable, enduring, and important. Indeed, important in ways beyond anything that anyone could ever have foreseen or imagined when it was founded. By way of illustration, if I may, let me cite three people, uh, uh, three people, all fellows of the Royal Society, whose stories I've come across completely by chance while researching other matters in the last year or so. People whose importance to the world could not have been the same without the existence of the Royal Society. 
The first of these I would offer is one of the great heroes of my own nation, Benjamin Franklin, who became a fellow of the Royal Society in 1756, nearly two decades before the political events that would make him famous to most of us. It would be hard to think of anybody who better illustrates the wisdom of Royal Society policies than Franklin. He absolutely, absolutely personified the, everything the Society stood for. Like so many others of that incredibly busy age, he was into everything. He considered how and why water evaporates from puddles, what causes fossils, why rock strata are so often tilted and jumbled. He discovered and really quite brilliantly explained the Gulf Stream and very nearly elucidated the germ theory of disease a century before Pasteur. He made many practical inventions, bifocals and the lightning rod, to name but two. Above all, he became a foremost authority on, on electricity at a time when electricity was one of the most exciting mysteries of science. Among much else, he created the world's first electric battery and coined the terms positive and negative in regard to electrical charge. Now, we're also familiar with Franklin's achievements and to thinking of him as an almost godlike figure, certainly if you come from America, but it is, easy, it is easy to forget that Franklin was a man who had practically no formal education and came from what was then a provincial backwater. At the time he began his scientific experiments, he was a journeyman printer in a far-off colony who had a talent for coining amusing aphorisms, and that was about it. He needed the Royal Society to give him confidence and stature, and that it most assuredly did. Without the Royal Society, Benjamin Frank, the Benjamin Franklin who has come down through history could scarcely have existed. Interestingly, by the way, the one scientific thing Franklin didn't do, it now seems, was the one thing he is most famous for, where I come from, namely flying a kite in a thunderstorm to prove that lightning was indeed electrical. It is a story still lovingly repeated in almost every American school book. I mentioned it myself in my introduction to seeing further, uh, which is why I mention it again now here. It appears, in fact, that Franklin didn't actually fly a kite into a thunderstorm and never actually claimed to have done so, at least not exactly. His report to the Royal Society merely described how such an experiment might be carried out. The idea, as you will remember, was that Frank Franklin flew a kite in a storm and that dangling from the string near the end of his kite was a key in a glass jar. The, key, the kite attracted an electrical charge which traveled down the string to the key and made it rattle in the jar or so we were taught in school when I was a boy. It was important for purposes of the experiment somehow that Franklin and the key be undercover and dry, and so the kite was flown out a window. The thing is, you can't fly a kite out a window. You just can't do it. It's nearly impossible to get it launched, and then if you did manage to get it launched, it's all but impossible to control and maneuver. More to the point, if the string connecting the kite to the key did attract a bolt of lightning, anyone foolish enough to be grounded to it at the earth end would, would receive a positively enormous and almost certainly lethal jolt. The key in its jar wouldn't tinkle gaily like a bell above a shop doorway, but would essentially explode like a stick of dynamite. Since Franklin understood the physics of lightning well enough to invent the lightning rod, it's pretty nearly certain that he wouldn't have been rash enough to hold on to any length of string that was in danger of, of conducting an extremely robust charge of energy from a storm cloud to his arm. Now here's the thing. It was Franklin's standing as a scientist that made him greatly admired in France. And it was because of this admiration that the French were prepared to receive him as an important visitor and listen sympathetically to his appeal for financial support for the American cause during the American War of Independence. Without that support, the American colonies could never have sustained and eventually prevailed in a lengthy war. So we may actually say that it is thanks to the Royal Society in some, some tangential but absolutely crucial sense that America gained its independence from Britain, <laughs> for which I would like to say thank you. <laughs> Even more incidentally, it has also been said that when the new nation of America was debating what to call its chief executive, it was Franklin who suggested the term president after the head of the Royal Society. So thank you again. You really cannot exaggerate the importance of the Royal Society's policy of openness to people from all backgrounds in all countries. Foreigners gave a new and additional perspective that it could not otherwise have had. The reason Benjamin Franklin discerned the existence of the Gulf Stream was not simply because he was observant and had a scientific mind, but because he crossed the Atlantic Ocean repeatedly and was exposed to its effects again and again. 
It isn't enough, in short, just to have great minds, but you have to have great minds at work in the right places. And that brings us to my second hero, whom I will mention much more briefly, a man named Richard Carrington, who was English and lived from 1826 to 1875. Carrington was one of the great examples of being in the right place at the right time. I came upon him entirely by chance while reading about an event of great commercial importance, the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania in 1859 by the man known to history as Colonel Edwin Drake, even though he wasn't actually a colonel, but rather a failed railway conductor. The story, as you may recall, is that Drake and his business partners decided to drill for oil in Pennsylvania, and everyone thought them completely mad for drilling. But they persisted at great expense and eventually struck oil, and in so doing, laid the foundations for an industry that would eventually and utterly change the world. Now, it so happens that at the very time, the very week of this event, the Earth suffered a, a sudden great atmospheric disturbance of a type never before seen. Magnets and telegraph systems all over the world suddenly went haywire. A roaring of unparalleled brilliance spread across the skies and became visible as far south as the Caribbean, where they had obviously never been seen before. The whole of Earth's atmosphere was suddenly and spectacularly in turmoil. Now, the cause of this would have been a complete and worrisome mystery, except that one man, an amateur astronomer standing on Box Hill in Surrey, happened to be watching the sun at that very moment. It was Richard Carrington. Carrington was unusual in that, he, in that he spent more time looking at the sun than at stars. He was particularly interested in sunspots. Unfortunately, he had very limited chance to exercise his interest in astronomy because he had to run the family business, a very large brewery called the Royal Brewery at Brentford in Middlesex. So it was a rare treat for him to be able to get away. But somehow, on September 1st, 1859, he managed to get a day off from the brewery and was standing on Box Hill where he kept a private observatory and was watching the sun at exactly the moment that it erupted in an enormous flare of a type now known as a coronal mass ejection. It was the biggest solar outburst that has ever been recorded. Today, a similar outburst would cripple communications all over the planet and cause unimaginable havoc. And we know all about it simply because Richard Carrington happened to get it the right day off and to be probably the only man on the planet who was actually looking at the sun at the right time. Carrington became celebrated in astronomical circles and was elected a fellow of the Royal Society the following year. The rest of his story is not quite so happy, I'm sorry to say. He grew increasingly deranged and argumentative and became famous for disrupting meetings of various astronomical societies. Quite late in life, he married suddenly and unexpectedly a woman much younger than himself, but soon afterwards, both he and his wife died in strange and mysterious circumstances. The suspicion has long been that he murdered her and then killed himself. On the plus side, however, he left 2,000 pounds to the Royal Society. <laughs> now, I don't know quite what the moral of all that is, so let me move swiftly on to my third example of unexpected ways in which the Royal Society makes the world a better place, and that is the wonderful case of the Reverend Thomas Bayes. Now, I first came across Thomas Bayes while looking for notable vicars for a book I was working on, and the book that was recently published called At Home, which is loosely about my own home, an old rectory in Norfolk. My house was built in 1851, and one of the things that was notable about country parsons in those days was that they were pretty, generally pretty well educated, uh, pretty well off, and had a lot of time on their hands. And so many of them did a number of extraordinary things. If I may quote from my own book, Sorry, I've lost the page. The last thing I said to myself as I left to come here tonight was don't forget to mark that page, Bill. This is just some examples of, of clergymen in the 19th century and the sorts of things they did. George Bailden, a vicar in a remote corner of Yorkshire, had such poor attendances at his services that he converted, converted half his church into a hen house, but became a self-taught authority, authority in linguistics and compiled the world's first dictionary in Icelandic. 
Not far away, Lawrence Stern, vicar of a parish near York, wrote popular novels of which the life and, and opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman is much the best remembered. Edmund Cartwright, rector of a rural parish in Leicestershire, invented the power loom, which in effect made the Industrial Revolution truly industrial. In Devon, the Reverend Jack Russell bred the terrier that shares his name, while in Oxford, the Reverend William Buckland wrote the first scientific description of dinosaurs and, not incidentally, became the world's leading authority on coprolites, fossilized feces. Thomas Robert Malthus in Surrey wrote an essay on the principle of population, which, as you will all recall from your school days, suggested that increases in food supply could never keep up with population growth for mathematical reasons. The Reverend William Greenwell of Durham was a founding father of modern archaeology, though he is better remembered among anglers as the inventor of Greenwell's glory, the most beloved of all trout flies. In Dorset, the Perkley named Octavia, Octavius Pickard Cambridge became the world's leading authority on spiders, while his contemporary, the Reverend William Shepherd, wrote a history of dirty jokes. <laughs> John Clayton of Yorkshire gave the first practical demonstration of gas lighting. The Reverend George Garrett of Manchester invented the submarine. Adam Bubble, uh, Buddle, a botanist vicar in Essex, was the eponymous inspiration for the flowering Buddleia. The Reverend John Mackenzie Bacon of Berkshire was a pioneering hot air balloonist and the father of aerial photography. And so it goes on. It was just the most amazing run of, of, of distinction by, by clergymen in the 19th century and indeed in the 18th century. But perhaps the most extraordinary of all of these people, and certainly my favorite, was the Reverend Thomas Bayes whom I like so much that I included him not only in my own book, but also in my introduction to seeing further. Bayes was from Tunbridge Wells in Kent, and he was by all accounts a hopeless preacher, but a brilliant mathematician. At some point, he devised a very complex mathematical equation that has come to be known as the Bayes theorem. Now, people who understand the theorem can use it to work out various probability distributions of all kinds. It's a way of, of arriving at statistical likelihoods based on partial information. The remarkable feature of Bayes' theorem is that it had no practical applications at all in his own lifetime. You need very powerful computers to do the volume of calculations necessary to arrive at useful computations. So in Bayes' day, it was simply an interesting but fundamentally pointless exercise. <laughs> Bayes evidently thought so little of his theorem that he didn't even bother to publish it. It was a friend who sent it to the Royal Society two years after Bayes' death, where it was published in the Society's Philosophical Transactions. In fact, it was a milestone in the history of mathematics. Today, Bayes' theorem is used in countless ways, in modeling climate change, in interpreting radiocarbon dates, in social policy, astrophysics, stock market analysis, weather forecasting, and wherever else probability is an issue. And it exists today simply because nearly 250 years ago, someone at the Royal Society decided it was worth preserving just in case. I think that is the most marvelous thing. Now, my point in mentioning these three particular examples is that you can hardly delve anywhere in any area of human endeavor, not just in science, and not find the Royal Society at the very heart of things, which raises a fourth extraordinary point about the Royal Society. It is still here. More than that, it is still here, and it is still important. Now, how many enterprises can you name that are still doing today what they were formed to do 350 years ago? Today, the Royal Society's interests remain an inspiration to recite. It provides 350 research fellowships, and its grants support the work of 3,000 scientists all over the world. It bestows great numbers of medals and prizes, maintains an active program of lectures and debates, and beholds a beloved summer science exhibition. It acts as the scientific conscience of the nation. It publishes seven journals and an endless stream of papers. It remains emphatically international in its outlook, maintaining close links with 91 science academies around the world. As I said in my introduction to the book, if we have an Earth worth living on 100 years from now, the Royal Society will be one of the organizations our grandchildren will wish to thank. It is impossible to list all the ways that the Royal Society has influenced the world, but you can get some idea by typing in Royal Society as a word search in the electronic version of the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography. That produces 218 pages of results. That's just lists of names, 218 pages of them. It would take you six months to read through all of the entries. It is more central to the life and history of Great Britain than most people realize. If you removed from the historical record all that the fellows of the Royal Society have done, you would have to rediscover or reinvent photography, the internet, 
bank holidays, the theory of evolution, antibiotics, the understanding of gravity, the unraveling of DNA, the whole of the electronics industry, Big Bang Theory, and literally uncountable hundreds and hundreds of thousands of vital things more. It is impossible to exaggerate the importance of science to this country, historically and currently. Chemistry alone is worth 50 billion pounds a year to the British economy right now. The prestige value simply cannot be measured. Britain has just 1% of the world's people, but produces by one reckoning 14% of the most frequently cited scientific papers. That is a staggeringly disproportionate total and ought to be a source of pride to every single person in the country. And yet science seems to be under a strange and relentless attack at the moment. Many of you will be familiar, a few of you may even yet sting from an extraordinary broadside by Simon Jenkins in The Guardian earlier this summer against science and its costs. He seemed to think that modern science is somehow a great scam. And of course, we are in the shadow of a looming spending cuts which are expected to hit science and research hard. Frankly, I find that really disappointing. The glory of this country, the thing I admire more about it than any other, is that in a really small space, you produce an amazing amount of wonderfulness here in theater, music, art, literature, science, and a great deal else. If you take away men's tennis and World Cup football, you are really fantastic at everything. <laughs> It would be a foolish tragedy to throw away any of that glorious, unpredictable abundance of creative activity in any of those fields, science not least, because we somehow feel compelled to do a kind of mass penance for a brief spell of irrational exuberance by the financial world. I just don't get that. All of this was put into a certain perspective for me by an experience I had a year or so ago. You know, I'm chancellor at Durham University, and in that position, I often take I'm taken to visit various departments. Now, one of my visits last year, they took me to the engineering department to see one of their new toys, something called a radio frequency anechoic chamber. They explained to me that essentially it's just a soundproof chamber. And I thought, well, how interesting can that be? And then I got there and saw it and thought, well, not very, evidently. <laughs> because it really was just a soundproof chamber with foam baffles. It looked exactly like a radio broadcast booth, only slightly roomier, but it really didn't look anything much at all. But what I learned is that in the hands of the amazingly dedicated and cerebrally supercharged people in Durham's engineering department, this dull chamber may one day perform miracles. By allowing engineers to control radio waves at ever finer resolutions, it could change the world in a hundred ways. It could provide a means to detect breast cancer so early that it never ever kills anyone again. Or find people who are lost in the wilderness if they're carrying a mobile phone, even if it's switched off. Or let firemen look through walls and see who's trapped inside burning buildings. And a whole lot more. And all this exciting potential is contained in just one small chamber in one corner of one department of one university, which is, of course, just one of 114 British universities, all doing dedicated research. And that's not to mention all the industrial and NHS and charitable research labs and so on, all of them doing interesting and exciting things, any one of which could fundamentally change the world. The idea that any of that is expendable or surplus to requirements is simply bizarre. Now hold that thought for a moment, please, while we shift very quickly, but I hope adroitly, to our second topic, which is a really, really, really short history of nearly everything. Now, a few years ago, you, as you may know, I wrote a book called A Short History of Nearly Everything, which was my attempt to understand the world and the universe around it and how they got, both got to be the way they are. Or as I put it in the book, how we went from there being nothing at all to there being something, and then how a little of that something eventually turned into us. Now, one of the things that particularly fascinated me was how scientists figured things out. How did they know where the continents were 300 million years ago? Or how hot it is on the surface of the sun or what goes on at the heart of a gene, or what was happening in the universe in its first three minutes. How do they even know that the universe had a first three minutes and hasn't just been there forever? How does anybody ever figure these things out? And so the book became for me a kind of quest to find out not only what we know, but how we know what we know. 
And so for about four years, I did almost nothing but try to understand science and its achievements. I traveled to 11 countries on five continents, read lots and lots of books and journals and transcripts and monographs, and asked enormous amounts of really dumb questions of incredibly kind and patient experts from a variety of disciplines. I didn't have any particular outcome in mind, no ax to grind or anything like that. I was just trying to pack an empty mind with as much interesting information as it could hold. But in doing the book, I found myself being drawn, again and, being drawn again and again to certain inescapable conclusions about the universe and we live in it and our part in it, including four really remarkable facts. I think they may be the four most remarkable facts there are, and I would like to share those with you briefly now. So here, without ado, they are the four most remarkable facts I know. First, you exist. You're alive. That's really quite a marvelous thing to be able to say when you stop and think about it. For you to be here now, trillions and trillions of drifting atoms had somehow to come together to make you. In the whole history of the universe, atoms have never got together quite this way before, and they never will again. These atoms came to Earth from all over. They could be anything. But for some reason, they've decided for a few tens of years to be you. That's pretty extraordinary, if you ask me. Now, why atoms do this is a puzzle. Being you is not a gratifying experience for the atom. <laughs> An atom doesn't even know you're there. It doesn't even know it's there. Atoms are mindless particles. They, after all, they don't know a thing. Yet somehow, for the length of your existence, these tiny devoted particles will engage in all the delicate cooperative efforts necessary to keep you humming, to make you you, to give you form and shape, and let you enjoy this, the rare and supremely agreeable condition known as life. Now, this is really hard to explain because there's nothing special about the atoms that make you. A human being or any other living thing is an assortment of almost embarrassingly mundane components, principally carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. This is the same stuff you would find in a pile of dirt. The only thing special about the atoms that make you is that they make you. That is, of course, the miracle of life. But having obliging atoms is only part of the good fortune that got you here to the Guild Hall on quite a lovely evening in 2010. You've also been incredibly lucky genealogically, ancestrally. Statistically speaking, you shouldn't be here. None of us should. Survival on Earth is surprisingly hard work. It is a curious fact of our existence that we come from a planet that is very good at producing life, but even better at extinguishing it. Of all the billions of species of organism that have sprung up and existed on Earth in its long productive history, 99.99% are no longer here. They're gone, gone forever. The remarkable fact is that the normal condition for a species on Earth is to be extinct. The average species on this planet lasts for only about four million years. If you wish to last longer, as we most assuredly do, then you must continually recreate yourself. You must be prepared to change everything that defines you. Shape, size, color, physiology, diet, metabolism, everything. And to do so repeatedly, in the right sequence at precisely the right historical moments. For us to be here now, it has been necessary for our ancestors to make all kinds of wholesale adjustments, all of them random, none of them inevitable or even necessarily logical, but every one of them necessary to get us here today. So we've been very lucky in that way too. But even that's not enough. You've also got nearly four billion years of reproductive good fortune behind you as an individual. Consider the fact that for you to be here now, every one of your ancestors on both sides since the dawn of time has been attractive enough to find a mate, robust enough to reproduce, and sufficiently blessed by fate and circumstance to live long enough to do so. Not one of your forebears in nearly four billion years on either side was squashed, devoured, stranded, starved, stuck fast, pipped by a more glamorous suitor, spurned or otherwise deflected from its life's quest of delivering a tiny charge of genetic material to the right partner at the right moment to perpetuate the only possible sequence of hereditary combinations that could result, eventually, astoundingly, and all too briefly, in you. I don't wish to belabor the point, but life is a damn lucky thing when you stop to think about it. Your existence is a miracle, and you really shouldn't let a day pass that you don't rejoice in having it. Which brings me to my second amazing fact. Life doesn't happen anywhere else in the universe, as far as we know. Now, that really is odd. The atoms that so freely and congenially clump together to form living things on Earth seem entirely disinclined to do, it else, do so elsewhere. Of course, the evidence isn't all in yet. So far, astronomers have found only a few dozen or so 
planets beyond our own solar system out of the 10 billion trillion or so that are thought to exist. So we can hardly claim to have scoured every corner of the universe. But it is certainly the case that the only life that has turned up so far, and very possibly ever will, is found on this one single unprepossessing blue planet in a nameless solar system two-thirds of the way out from the center of the Milky Way. And that's not much in a great big universe, particularly when you consider that all that life on that small blue planet is found almost exclusively in a frail wisp of water and atmosphere around the surface. If you imagine the Earth shrunk down to the size of a standard desktop globe, then the atmosphere is only about the thickness of two coats of varnish. And the part of that atmosphere that supports life, the biosphere as it is known, is only a small part of that. Most of the Earth is too cold or dry or lofty and thin-aired for most types of life. Humans, even with the advantage of clothing and shelter, can manage to live on only about 12% of Earth's landscape. Other animals are restricted further still. In consequence, most of Earth's life is confined to an exceedingly modest range. Just 1.4% of Earth's land area contains more than half its biodiversity. I can't think of a better reason than that to be worried about global warming. Which brings me to my third and penultimate amazing fact, that we live on a planet that we don't really know. There may be no other detectable life in the universe, but there is such an abundance of it here on our own planet that we don't actually know how much there is. We don't even remotely know. I find that quite amazing. Even more amazing, we don't even know what we know. No one has ever managed to collate the total number of known living things on the planet. Most estimates for the number of named species of living things put, a, put it at a figure of about one and a half million, but that's really only a guess. As for the number of unnamed, yet to be identified species of living things, we are even more clueless. It may be tens of millions, it may be hundreds of millions. But according to one extraordinary estimate, perhaps as much as 97% of all that lives on the earth and in the seas is still to be discovered. And so to my fourth amazing fact, the last one I will burden you with here tonight, I promise. Namely, that all life comes from a single moment of creation. Some 3.8 billion years ago, in some bubbling mud pot or deep ocean vent, some little bag of chemicals twitched and became animate and then miraculously reproduced itself. Everything that lives now on Earth or ever has lived descends from that moment. We are all built from a single original blueprint. I don't believe there is a more important or remarkable fact in the natural world, indeed in any world, than that one. Since life arose, Earth has produced, it's estimated, some 30 billion different species of creature, which is a much, much, much larger number than it sounds. If you imagine that I projected slides of all those 30 billion creatures uh, on a screen behind me at the rate of one a second, it would take nearly a thousand years to get through them all. 30 billion is a large number. So Earth has produced a lot of life in its time. And out of all that number of species, just one has been smart enough and sensitive enough to reflect upon its place in the universe, to manipulate the environment to make it more productive and secure, to look beyond its own immediate needs and to work out strategies for improving its lot. And only one, the same one, alas, has been reckless enough or foolish enough to trifle with the air it breathes, bulldoze its forests and jungles, dynamite its coral reefs drive to extinction creatures on land, sea, and in the air. We are in the uncanny position of being simultaneously life's best hope and its worst nightmare. It is a mystery to me why it is so hard for us as beings to see how vulnerable we are, to appreciate that we have all the water we're ever going to get, the only air we're going to breathe. We're not going to find new oceans teeming with life or some backup Amazonia that we have somehow till now overlooked. We have all that we are ever going to have. This is all there is. There is nowhere else to go. The most brilliant and thoughtful naturalist of our generation, Edward O. Wilson, who is, it goes without saying, a fellow of the Royal Society, put it better and more succinctly than anyone ever has. In his classic work, The Diversity of Life, he wrote, one planet, one experiment. It really is as simple as that. We're moving into a world that is very uncertain and very scary in all kinds of ways. Every problem we have will be solved by science or it won't be solved. This really is no time for cutting. Oh, and there's just one other thing that I learned about while researching my book about life. It doesn't last very long, I'm afraid. Even a good, full human life goes on for only about 650,000 hours. It doesn't seem very much. So there really isn't a moment to be lost. 
I don't know about you, but with that in mind, I'm really going to enjoy a drink in a minute. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure everyone who came here this evening knew about Bill Bryson. They expected something wonderful. They haven't been disappointed. I think he has succeeded, as we all hoped, in entertaining us, informing us, and uplifting us by this wonderful uh, lecture. And I think everything he has done today consolidates his position as one of Britain's national treasures, young though he still is. I would like, uh, since I'm standing here, not only to thank him for this lecture, but to thank him for other things as well. Uh, he has been a very good friend of the Royal Society. He has advised us on many of the events we've had in his anniversary year. And indeed, as editor of the book, Seeing Further, the Story of Science and the Royal Society, he has done us a great service, and I would like to put in a plug for that book, and indeed for his other book, which he uh, showed us during his lecture. It's a wonderful uh, book, and I uh, encourage you to, uh, to buy it, um, and it's only so wonderful because of the inspiration and leadership of Bill Bryson. I'd like also to express thanks at this point uh, to the Lord Mayor of London, the City of London Corporation, for hosting this evening's lecture and also Gresham College for its significant role in organising tonight's event. Just a historical remark, uh, as Bill has told us, the Royal Society's foundation was uh, closely linked with that of Gresham College. That is where the early fellows of the Royal Society met. And they were, of course, all um, people who were fascinated by everything, they were polymaths. Indeed, they were all rather like Bill Bryson, I imagine, when they uh, attended these meetings and uh, did these mysterious experiments. But just one uh, um, anecdote, uh, the Royal Society was thrown out of Gresham's College in 1666 in order to make way for the Lord Mayor and the city merchants. That's because the Guildhall was itself gutted in the Great Fire. And so that's another example of the links between uh, the three organisations involved here uh, tonight. One point I would like to make, which again Bill alluded to in his uh, lecture, um, he emphasised uh, that the early members of the Royal Society, they call themselves ingenious and curious gentlemen, they were fascinated by all kinds of weird things. They did these experiments, they heard travellers' tales, they did dissections, etc. But they were concerned also with the practical issues of their time, with navigation, with discovering how to measure longitude, and of course, most famously, with rebuilding London after the fire. So they were concerned to understand the world and to change the world. And I think it's important to emphasize that that is equally true today, although on a bigger scale. The scientists in the Royal Society and in this country are very successful indeed in understanding nature and the world. The UK is very strong in science. We are second only to the United States by almost all criteria. And I think by uh, many criteria, you could say there's more brain for the buck here than in any other country. And there are rather few areas of uh, national life where we can say we are number two in the world, so let's not jeopardize those where that is now the case. And science in this country is not only uh, done in universities by people motivated in the same way as the pioneer fellows of the Royal Society, but of course it permeates the whole of the economy and indeed, I think everyone would accept that if the UK is to thrive and embark on a high-growth, high-tech-led economy, then we can do this only if we ensure that bright people are attracted into science, taught well in our universities, and encouraged. 
and the Royal Society's aim is to ensure that this happens and we hope that our political masters are receptive to this. It requires a collaboration between scientists in academia and in industry and the Royal Society itself very concerned about this. We try to ensure that the young scientists we support are made aware of what they can do in industry, give them courses in entrepreneurship, etc. And also we are indeed setting up a small venture capital fund called the Enterprise Fund in order by example as well as by precept to encourage early stage investment in high tech companies. So for all these reasons I hope it is the case as Bill said that the Royal Society is relevant to the UK today and indeed its activities are crucial for the future. So let me once again thank our hosts and friends here in the city in the City of London Corporation and Gresham College for arranging uh, this event and once again to ask you to express your thanks for really a fascinating and magnificent lecture which we've been privileged to hear from Bill Bryson. Thank you very much. <laughs>